in the notes section. Awesome, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, we want to begin our, our worship together. A <clears throat> um, few things uh, by reminder, uh, opportunities that we have to gather together and to, to study God's Word together, our Bible classes each Sunday morning at 9.30 and also uh, Wednesday evening at 7.00. Uh, and encourage everyone to come participate in uh, those studies uh, and our worship, of course, beginning each Sunday morning at 1030. <clears throat> and a reminder that, that we do have this as uh, being recorded for your convenience uh, or for your evangelism, as may be appropriate. And uh, this is what it looks like on the on the website when you when you get there <clears throat> and a uh, couple of ways to get to it through Facebook and through YouTube there's a picture of our um, website and with links to it so, <coughs> uh, lots of uh, information of course the website's on the bulletin too so you, you have that handy with you and you can share that <coughs> and uh, use that uh, a, a growing repository of information there um, this Saturday uh, we will be having our dinner together, and uh, everyone is invited. Uh, this is our dinner with loved ones, and uh, February 10th seems like a long way off, but it's Saturday. So um, uh, we'll begin at 5 o'clock. There are sign-up uh, sheets on the bulletin board. If you are coming, please sign uh, so we make sure we get uh, enough food for everyone. And, um, uh, but do, do sign up and however many you're going to be uh, bringing with you. And also uh, there is, especially for the men, there's also a list of some uh, food items to bring. And uh, so it, it's a menu, so uh, we'll plan, a, plan accordingly. So you can see uh, what needs to be brought. It's two separate lists. One sign up for what you can bring and the other to sign up that you're going to be there. Five o'clock uh, on Saturday. A uh, reminder too that we have uh, the Challenge Youth Conference is coming up uh, February 23rd, 4th, and 5th. Uh, Mike has been doing a good job of making arrangements for that. Uh, uh, and there is a cabin reserve for place to stay. Currently we have 18 that are planning to go. And uh, Mike told me this morning we were able to get uh, tickets for everyone. So uh, that, that, that's a good number, 18. So. Uh, we want to pray for that event as well, too. I've got to notice uh, the church in Seneca. This is kind of far out there, but just to let you know for the ladies, uh, Saturday morning, April the 20th, um, there'll be, uh, and there's, a, there's more information on the bulletin board. They sent us a flyer so you can, you can uh, <coughs> get some more information. But just to let you know, uh, April the 20th, Saturday morning, and uh, I believe it'll be available online as they have in the past. Uh, that they'll be broadcasting live, um, but and I know in times past some of the ladies have had the opportunity to go and participate in that. So just to let you know that that's coming up today. We're having our our dinner together. Always uh, enjoy being able to share uh, food and uh, time together, and uh, so we'll we'll enjoy that today. This will be after our uh, worship this morning. And then uh, after, after we eat, we'll come back and we'll have singing together uh, before we go home. So <clears throat> look forward to, to having that time uh, with everyone here today. As always, we want to uh, remind ourselves uh, that, you know, we have such a great blessing in prayer. And uh, to pray for those who are in leadership, pray for those that we know of our brethren who are being persecuted. The persecution is real and around the world, and uh, we want to pray for our brethren uh, and pray for those that we have supported in the past and we continue to support in our prayers in uh, Costa Rica and India, Kenya, and uh, other places. So uh, there are lots of things that we're aware of that we have opportunities need for prayer. And also uh, we have uh, requests for those that... Uh, have requested that we pray for them and uh, I won't mention uh, everyone there's some information in the bulletin that you can kind of uh, catch up on but one thing uh, I think many people here are already aware of uh, and if you're not 
Um, our sister Cheryl Hicks uh, died this morning. And uh, you know that she'd been struggling with uh, heart issues for a little while, had been in the hospital. She was back in the hospital uh, late yesterday. And uh, um, uh, Chris had posted uh, early this morning that, that uh, she had died. So uh, as of right now, that's all we know. Uh, so we'll let you know whatever arrangements may be made for a funeral and so forth um, when that becomes known. But um, we're sad for our loss, and uh, we're um, thankful that we've had her as a blessing in our life and that uh, uh, the Lord uh, is, uh, is in, in, in her keeping now. <clears throat> Um, Mike had um, uh, sent some information to uh, Gary this morning. Uh, Sierra Gearing uh, is Mike's niece. She had a bad accident, and uh, I guess this past week, and uh, she's at home now, but uh, she's had lots of uh, facial fractures and torn ligaments in her neck, and so she's recovering from that. And uh, Christy Little is her uh, mother and uh, she had back surgery on Tuesday and so Mike had asked us to to remember these two uh, in our prayers as well um, we want to also remember uh, uh, Kathy Johnson she's had a, a large kidney stone uh, hopefully they'll be able to take care of it with lithotripsy uh, but it is large and uh, so that may not work and if it doesn't work there'll be surgery involved of course um, uh, we also aware, made aware that Eric uh, Griswold has uh, cancer now in his lungs and his liver and he's scheduled for chemo in a couple of weeks so we want to continue to remember Eric as, as well in our prayers. Uh, Gary mentioned to us uh, Seth Potts, member over at uh, Harmony Grove, uh, he did, did have a trans heart transplant last week. He's now off the ventilator. Uh, of course, recovery is going to be uh, slow, and uh, it's, he said it's been about a month since he's seen his boys, and hopefully be able to see them today. So I want to continue to remember uh, Seth as well. Kathy Scott is at home and recovering and uh, recuperating well at home. She very much appreciates our prayers uh, on her behalf. So <clears throat> you may be aware of others that we need to remember in our prayers as well. And uh, so we want to take a moment uh, for each of us to pray individually, not only for these, but other situations that you may be aware of. Uh, and in a couple of minutes, then Mike is going to come uh, and lead us in prayer. So uh, let's pray together then. Dear Heavenly Father, the things that bring us back to Lord, we can sing praise of the name and worship you. Let those who could be with us in the city of the city of all women and Lord. Bless us all the morning of all to Miss Cheryl and just bless Miss Amy and Miss Donnie and Dear and Christy and just everybody on the prayer list, Lord. Let us be attentive to the lesson today and so we able to apply the lessons to our everyday life. So we need blessings to give all our sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
The affairs of the world today are what they are. And uh, our Lord is in control of all things. So as we are here together, let us focus our minds and our attention on the things that we're here to do, to worship Him and honor Him as we should, uh, even as we studied this morning that we worship Him in spirit and in truth. <coughs> Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, <coughs> said, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. As we... Uh, worship together in our singing, uh, thinking about the words that we're expressing from our hearts, proclaiming these to God, to, to one another, uh, as we express our love and devotion for Him, and especially for all the blessings that He's given to us. I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King. And I love you with the love of the Lord. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. There is only one God, there is only one King. There is only one body, that is why we can sing. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. A common hope for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of God's Word. A common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of God's Word. At this time as we gather, we are reminded that God accepts all of us, everything out of us, all that we have, our spiritual, emotional, the lives that we lead, uh, our dedication, our commitment to Him, being Christ's life. He wants to tell that's something that we need to strive for. But in the family here, 
He is just asking for a small part of what we have in this world that we contribute to this family for the lights, for the building, and for things that we do for uh, the, the saints, for the, for, the, for the missionaries, for each other, that we continue to work in this world for, for, the, for this family. And we also told that we give from the heart. There is no sin. Jesus said, you at least give more than the Pharisees. When you give from the heart, you give, you give, you give it more. And we remind him also to give everything else that we have to give. Look at some people here. Let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, we just want to come to you at this time to thank you so much for all the wonderful blessings you've given us life to. We thank you for the sunshine that you send to brighten our days, Father. We thank you for the rain that, uh, that falls to, to nourish the land, Father. But more importantly, Father, we thank you for your Son and our Savior who reigned in heaven with you, Lord. We just want to ask that you would be with us this morning as we take up this contribution that uh, that you would use, it, Father, as your will to um, help spread the, your word. Father, we pray that you Use it to help those that are in need, Father. More important, Father, we just pray that your will would be done, Lord. We just continue that you would bless this congregation and help us to continue to grow uh, and your grace and your knowledge, Father. We ask and pray all these things to your Son and our Savior. Praise Jesus. Let's Peter, in the letter that he addressed to the churches, said, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. As we sing the words of this song, we're reminded that, that we're stewards, that we have responsibilities, and especially that we might honor God by the things that we do through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And after we sing uh, uh, this song together, then Roy is going to lead us in prayer. <clears throat> A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never-dying soul to save, and fit it for the sky, to serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. Powers engage to do my master's will. Arm me with jealous care as in thy sight to live. And O oh, thy servant, Lord, prepare a strict account to give. Help me to watch and pray, and on thyself rely. A 
should if I my trust betray, I shall forever die. Let's pray together. John reminds us in his uh, letter that he addressed uh, also to the churches. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. This song reminds us truly of uh, the, how deep the Father's love for us is. <clears throat> deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulder. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying 
healing breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not most in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. <clears throat> As we sing the words of this song, reminded, we remind ourselves of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And following this, we'll partake the Lord's Supper together. Uh, truly a blessing and a privilege that we have to remember our Savior. <clears throat> wounded for me, wounded for me, there on the cross he was wounded for me. Gone my transgressions, and now I am free. Oh, because Jesus was wounded for me. Dying for me, dying for me. There on the cross he was dying for me. Now in his death my redemption I see. Oh, because Jesus was dying for me.
kind and gracious heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this bread that represents the broken body of Christ. Heavenly Father, as we do so, let us examine ourselves. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this great and wonderful sacrifice. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Most kind and gracious heaven, Father, we ask that you bless this food and honor and represent the pure blood of Christ on that cross. Heavenly Father, help us to take this time to examine ourselves and remember that dark day that we may be offered and sacrificed for us. This is Jesus, the Holy Name of Christ. Amen.
Risen for me, risen for me, up from the grave he is risen for me. Now evermore from death's sting I am free, all because Jesus has risen for me. Coming In Isaiah uh, chapter 6 and verse 8, part of the vision that he had there, he said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. Jesus in teaching his disciples said, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The words of this song are uh, words that ex hopefully just express our desire that we all want to be workers for the Lord. <clears throat> if it's convenient for you, would you stand with me while we sing together? I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust His holy word. I want to sing and pray and be busy every day in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray in the vineyard, in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of the Lord. I want to be a worker every day. I want to lead the erring in the way that leads to heaven above where all is peace and love in the kingdom of the Lord. I will work, I will pray in the vineyard, in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of the Lord. I want to be a worker strong and brave. I want to trust in Jesus' power to save. All who will truly come shall find a happy home in the kingdom of the Lord. I will work, I will pray in the vineyard, in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of the Lord. Please be seated. The song after Gary's lesson this morning is uh, Who Will Follow Jesus, number 760 in our songbook. Good morning. good morning. It's good to see everybody here. I, I have a simple question this morning, uh, and uh, you can see it there. Uh, are you a disciple of Jesus? And we're, we're gonna we're gonna talk some about that because there there are some that think that uh, becoming a disciple of Jesus, well, that, that's something they just they can't do. It is, is always it seems to be just 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 a little bit out of reach and, and in some cases they may feel it's completely totally there's no way I can reach it why even try 
And so there's, there's no way I can be a disciple of Jesus. When we look at, again, this uh, idea, this uh, term disciple, and there's some that is, okay, a disciple of Jesus. I, I know exactly what that means. That's somebody who has their act together. That's somebody who just doesn't struggle with sin, isn't tempted or anything. They just go through life and, and they are just step by step. They're just following right after Jesus and they don't have a problem and that's not me. And so there's no way that I could be a disciple. We look at, again, this idea of, of following after Jesus and it, what a tough act to follow. We look at First uh, Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 21. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. And here's where those steps are leading. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. I'm supposed to act like that? I have a hard time with that, so there's no way I can be a disciple. 1 John 3 and verse 5, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Again, he came here to take away sins, and he didn't have any sins in the first place. And then Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, our instructions from the one we're supposed to be following, You therefore must be perfect. As your heavenly Father is perfect. I'm not perfect. So again, if I am not perfect, and I'm supposed to be following after the perfect one, why should I even try? For some, the idea of becoming a disciple of Jesus seems uh, like a no-brainer. Totally easy. No problem at all. I can just uh, I, I can do it with one arm tied behind my back. Because I, I read John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I believe in Jesus. I can, I can check that box off, so I must be a disciple now. I can just do anything that I want. So I, I, can, I can do this whole disciple thing. Uh, 1 Peter 4 and verse 8, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Okay, I need to get rid of sin, and uh, so there we go. I'm just, I love everybody. Jesus loved everybody. I, I got this down. This is, this is pretty easy. I can be a disciple of Jesus. The idea of becoming a disciple uh, can have a pretty wide range of answers. Again, you're asking, you know, so, hey, are you a disciple? And, and well, some people have to think about it long and hard. Some people don't have to think about it at all. But let's think about what the definition of a disciple is. Because, uh, again, we're, we're reading the scriptures. We're reading God's instructions. What does he think? When he, if he was going to ask us, are you a disciple of my son? Well, what does a disciple mean? Uh, we look at uh, Strong's and, and see the, uh, uh, the word that was used there. And again, it, it doesn't mean a perfect person who never messes up. A, a disciple is someone who follows exactly in the footsteps and never steps out of line. It also doesn't mean a person who does a whole lot of nothing. Because they can kind of float on through and, and you know, check some boxes off and they're done. This idea of a disciple. Uh, you can see, uh, again, one of the descriptions here. If I can uh, break my laser out. Nobody look directly at the light. Uh, but here we have this, uh, you know, to become a pupil. It means a learner. Someone who is, uh, you know, following behind the teacher well if we just had a really good teacher how about a master teacher would that be great uh, thankfully that's exactly who Jesus is are we willing to learn and then do something with what we're learning because that's the idea of being a disciple 
Uh, not going into a situation that I already know everything, I'm just going to be here for the class, and uh, uh, whatever they say, I'm not really worried about it because I already know what I'm doing. Are we a learner? Do we have the desire to learn? It's only heaven and hell. I mean, we can look in the descriptions that, that God gave us, and here is how wonderful heaven is, and here is how horrible hell is, and we know we're going to one of those two places for all eternity. I think it's uh, very important to learn the lessons that God is providing for us if that is going to be the outcome. Are we willing to learn? Does that term uh, disciple or uh, an, an apprentice or a learner is that me I'll, I'll let you flip that around you can use that same question in your mind you don't have to answer it out loud is that me if, if God was giving a description of, of me would he call me a learner a disciple an apprentice Well, how does one become a disciple or an apprentice of Jesus? Again, I, there's a lot of different ways that you can do that according to Google. You just, you just type that in there and there will be millions of answers, I promise. Thankfully, we have a source, the source. We have God's instructions and we can go there and find out. And, of course, even information directly from the master teacher. In uh, Matthew chapter 28, you know, he's, he lets his disciples know that he has been given all authority in, in heaven and on earth. And then he gives them their instructions. And these are not his instructions that I'm about to read to you. But this is the way that the world sometimes views Jesus' last instructions. Even though it's, it's written there in, in black and white, or it may be red in, in your Bible. The way they act, this is what he said. Uh, so guys, if you feel comfy telling somebody about me during the regular course of your life, that would be nice of you. If your denomination does uh, baptisms, and if the uh, Trinitarian nature of God fits with your worldview, then great. Include those aspects in your effort. Be careful not to suggest that they follow my commandments too closely, though, that would just be weird. You don't want to be weird. I, I know it's really, really small font, so I decided to read that to you. Of course, actually, what he said was go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. How do we become disciples? Uh, he said, go and make disciples. And then he goes and explains, here's how that's going to work. Teach them the gospel. Help them obey the gospel. And then continue teaching. Teach them to observe, he didn't say most of what I have commanded you, some of what I've commanded you, all that I have commanded you that they think is okay because it follows along with what they already know and what they already believe. He, he didn't say any of that. I've given you some instructions. He had just been with these guys for three years. He had taught a lot. Everything that I've taught you. Now, take that and teach them. You're now the teachers. Go and make these disciples. And then we look at uh, uh, 2 Timothy 2 in, in verse 2, and, and Paul's the description of it is, again, teaching others so that they also can then teach others, so that they also can teach others and well, to infinity and beyond. This is something that is supposed to be ongoing. Again, does that sound like us? Are we constantly learning? doing 
and then, hey, I've just figured out something that's going to help us live for all eternity in, in the place that is beyond description and is wonderful and will keep us out of that place that's horrible, beyond description. Let me tell you about it. So you can also share that with others. See, there's a lot of people that know a lot about Jesus. There are a lot of people that study the Bible constantly. They can quote scriptures they know all about the life of Christ. They know who he claims to be, what he said he did, and, and all of that. They are not disciples of Jesus. There are folks that don't believe in God in the first place. That can quote uh, many more scriptures than many Christians. There are those that are of other religions. That have spent a lot of time studying the Bible. That can quote a lot of scriptures and know a lot about Jesus. Who are not disciples of Jesus. Just knowing something doesn't make us disciples. It's again this idea of learning and then doing something with that learning. A disciple, again, according to Matthew 28, 19 through 20. A disciple is one who's been baptized. And then taught to observe all the things that Jesus has taught. It is a very simple concept. He didn't make it hard that only the rich elite of the world would be able to afford to do. Even though it's worth way more money than everybody could afford to pay, even if we piled all our money together. It's something that everyone can do. And he wants everyone to do. But it's not without its challenges. <coughs> Becoming a disciple or an apprentice or a, a learner or a follower of Jesus. Well, there's some things that we have to, uh, to look at. Being an, an understudy, a learner of Jesus uh, can be very challenging because he's very demanding. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, again, as he was here and, and teaching others, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Family comes second when it comes to the Lord. And again, you, you get... Uh, I'm a, I'm a dad. I'm a granddad. And you, you pick up the little baby and you're just staring at them in their face and it's like, this is awesome. I will do anything for you. Except change that diaper. Mom, go ahead. No, no, no. I'll even change diapers. All right, I'll do, I'll, I'll feed you. I'll wake you up in the middle of the night because you're calling out and need help. All this, oh, I, I would do anything. But I won't sin. I won't lie for you. I won't do something that's going to separate me from God because I love God more than I love you. Is the attitude that Jesus wants of us. And again, that goes for mom, dad, brother, sister, son, daughter. For some people, this dog, car, cat. There's all kind of other things that they, they put in front of what God wants. Jesus is very demanding. I am first. Are you a disciple of me or not? Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We can put ourselves in that spot as well. Uh, let's forget about mom, dad, brother, sister, uh, son, daughter. Me. I, I kind of like me. I've known me my whole life. And I, I'm, I, I'm really close to me. I would do a lot for me. But God wants to be first. Even when it comes to me. See, it's... It, we don't uh, see a lot of crosses. Well, you know, people wear them. They're on T-shirts and hats, and they got bumper stickers and all kind of things. 
So again, when you look at whoever does not take his cross and follow me, it was I, I've got a cross. I can I can grab one. I'll I'll come and follow you. It's it's not exactly what he meant. In today's world, basically, he would have said, uh, "Whoever does not take his electric chair and, and follow me is not worthy of me." Whoa, hang on a sec. Um, electric chair. I, I know what happened. I, you know, it's not the little recliner that picks you up uh, by itself in in the living room. This is something that people are dying to get into, or at least out of. Those things kill you. Are we willing to die? Or move our life out of the way? Move me out of the way so that I can put God first? That's kind of demanding, isn't it? Because then that makes me second. And that's exactly what he means. And that is very, very hard for people that, you know, know, know me. And again, I'll let you uh, insert me there for you. Mark chapter 8 and verse 34, calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. And again, we, we see that in the first century. Uh, it, the church, unfortunately, had to literally live these verses. People were giving up their lives. They, they were... Uh, announcing their faith in Jesus uh, right before their family was killed, right before their eyes, and then, of course, they would die following that uh, usually as well. They were literally losing their life for him. And, of course, it happens around the world even today. We don't have to face that here at this particular point. But are we willing to lose the life that we have so that we can be pleasing to him? But I, I, I kind of like this uh, uh, job over here. I kind of like this, uh, this person that I'm with over here. I kind of like the things that I'm doing here. You mean God doesn't want me to do that and, and I have to give that up to be pleasing to him. Who's first Mark chapter 7 verse 37 they were astonished beyond measure saying he has done all things well he even makes a deaf hear and the mute speak uh, no he doesn't want us going out healing people uh, since we can't do that miraculously but again the teacher the one who is, is leading the way He's perfect. He does all things well. We are reflections of him. Can people say that about us? Because we look at uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. Again, uh, as we've seen, he, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. When he got cut off in traffic, he didn't ram his camel into the camel in front of him. I don't know if he rode camels. I know he at least rode a donkey once. People could go up to Jesus and say, okay... Look, I, I need you to tell me something. And, and they could tell that he was telling the truth again because, well, his lips were moving. And they knew, well, well, Jesus is telling the truth always. We can trust him. He could have been selling cars. He could have been a lawyer. I'm sorry if there's any car salesmen and lawyers in here. And, and, and just, but that's okay. It's Jesus. He's telling the truth because that's who he is. Are we apprenticing correctly? Can people see us and know that 
that is somebody who is following after Jesus? Or is it, well, they're just like everybody else? And, and we are like everybody else. We're just, we're human. We're people. We aren't perfect. But are we trying? Because, again, part of the scriptures were written so that here's where we're going, here's where we're striving, and a lot of it talks about, hey, you know, we need to work on this. We look at, uh, again, these uh, challenges that we face as we try to become the type of people that God, God wants us to be. And we have to, we have to fight our tongue. We have to fight our mouth. And, of course, it's all starting up here. What kind of thoughts are going through our head? James 1, verse 26, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Again, are, are we somebody that people can go to and we know they're telling the truth? Over and over again, they've been able to prove that, even if it's bad news, even if it's something different than I totally expect, even if it's something that may hurt my feelings, but they're going to tell me the truth. I can see their reaction to different things. I know this person is, is one that follows Jesus because they're not uh, spouting out words that uh, they're not supposed to be using. Whether they're happy, whether they're angry. James chapter 3, again, uh, he's, he spent a lot of time talking about this. It's almost like he thought this was going to be a problem for us. James chapter 3, verse 1, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his old body. But if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a, uh, is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Again, the powerful, dangerous tongue. Again, uh, maybe we have a, a second James written uh, uh, just this year. I, I, yes, I'm making that part up. But again, the thumb is a powerful thing. Because maybe we're not saying the words, maybe we're texting them. Uh, maybe our you know, fingers are very, very powerful. It can start fires too because we're emailing somebody and giving them a piece of our mind. See, it's, it's not really... That I didn't have a picture, so I just had to give you mine. And he's not really worried about that thing. He's got a bunch of uh, uh, lovely taste buds that we're going to get to test here in just a minute. Hopefully, everybody's going to stay for that. It, it helps us form words. It just it's it's just pretty cool if you sit there and think about you know again uh, you know the voice box and just all you do is move an air over. And tongue moving around a little bit, and, and 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 you're forming sounds that we all of a sudden you know what's going on in here. Well, the going on in here is what James is really worried about, because the words that we're using, 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 all start here, and this is the part that God wants us to be worried about. Is this? 
an apprentice, a learner, a disciple? Uh, does this make us sound like, look like, act like what God wants us to act like? Because that is something that is a challenge. And we can't just check the box and say, listen, I didn't, I didn't say anything wrong. I didn't type anything wrong. I sent no one bad text messages today. I must be good. I don't have to worry about it anymore. I mean, we can say that while we're sleeping, maybe. But while we're awake, we need to be paying attention to it. Colossians 4 and verse 6, again, uh, Paul told the church in Colossae, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And how hard is it if we are using words we aren't supposed to be using, we're very angry, we're just uh, reacting horribly to people and say, hey, listen, we, we would really love for you to come and study the Bible with us. It, it's hard if people know how you are. There's no way I want to be the type of Christian that they are. And they can be lost because they don't want to be the type of Christian that we are. But it's a challenge we got to face, meet, and beat. We also have to work on our, our attitude. We see first, first Corinthians 13, the first seven verses there. And again, uh, Paul describing all these gifts that, uh, that they had back then. Again, these miraculous uh, uh, gifts of the Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. He said you could be uh, you could be a superhero when it comes to uh, uh, spiritual gifts. You could do all of these things, and again, th these are supernatural things to be able to uh, to speak another language without even studying, to be able to receive knowledge uh, miraculously, again, just popping into our head from God, and then be able to to share that with others, to be able to heal people and and uh, raise the dead and do all these things that they could do back then. I give away all I have and if I deliver my body to be burned well, that's something we can actually do today but have not love I gain nothing do we show the same love to others that we receive from the Lord he loved us enough to die on the cross for us how much do we love our fellow man our family here our human family outside these walls. What is our attitude? Are we seeking and saving the lost? Just like Jesus did. Are we helping others that need the help? We see in <coughs> excuse me, Luke chapter 10, uh, again, you have uh, this, this story that he, he told of how we're supposed to help our neighbor out. Have a, a couple of uh, religious -y people that were very busy. They were on their mission. They were going to go ahead and go. They had the, uh, the Levite and the priest just walking by this person who was in obvious need. They had just been mugged. Had everything stolen from them. Clothes, wallet. You know, I, I don't see a car here, so it must have had his car taken away too. All of these, I mean, he was, he was just beaten. And they just... Walk on by. And then somebody who's normally not a friend walks by. His Samaritan. Uh, the, the Jews and Samaritans didn't, didn't get along. But here was somebody who's, hey, you need help. I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I mean, obviously, I, I don't think he was out on a Sunday stroll. He was probably going somewhere, too. Probably had something to do. He stopped and he helped because, well, that's the right thing to do. Are we good Samaritans? Again, maybe we're not uh, walking down the street looking for people who've been mugged. But is there somebody that's uh, hungry? Is there somebody that needs help? Is there somebody that needs an ear? Are we them? Acts chapter 10, again, this idea of... Uh, being a disciple, a follower, a learner, an apprentice. Well, Jesus went about to doing good. That was the thing that uh, as Peter was talking to Cornelius. Again, he was, he was a, a Gentile. He was a, uh, 
about to get to become a Christian, which was something that was uh, new at that particular time. Only Jews up to that point, but he said, even, even you, Cornelius, you and your family, you know who Jesus was because he wasn't here hiding. He went about doing good. Is that us? Is that me? I'll... Can the same thing be said about me? But if we're disciples, we're followers, we're, we're Christians, where does, the, where does the church come in? When we look at uh, 1 Timothy 3 and, and verse 14, it's the idea that, uh, well, here's, here's where we work on things together. I, my, uh, my goal, and uh, you know, we can go into the scriptures to be able to see this, uh, the, the goal is to, is to have that grand family reunion on the day of judgment. And, and to, Jesus is going to present the church to God and, and, and then to be able to enter into heaven and, and be able to spend all eternity together. But again, it's not us sitting in a hammock while we're here on earth and just uh, killing time waiting on that to happen. There are things that he wants us to do. I mean, the whole New Testament is written for these churches. Of, Here is what you need to be doing. And that goes for us as well. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things uh, to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. This is, again, not a group, uh, not a um, uh, social club, country club, hanging out club. This is a group of people that's coming together to worship God today, but also a group of people that has work to do. And so, again, one of the letters that Paul wrote to Timothy was, I'm writing so you know what you ought to be doing and how you ought to do it. There is a right way. And we talked this morning in the adult Bible class about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. There is a right way to do things. There is a right way on how we should be doing things, again, even ourselves mentally, as we're doing the right things. We see in Galatians chapter 6, again, where does the church come in with us being a disciple? Well, we learn to work with other disciples. There are some that are more skilled than we are. There are some that have been disciples for a really long time, and, well, they may be dealing with uh, things differently than, than we are. They may be facing the same temptations that we are. Some have uh, been able to figure out a way, this is how I'm going to get over this particular temptation. It's, it's not a bother to me, but this one over here is. Well, that one doesn't bother me, but this one does. What a great place to be able to come together and share in getting through life so that we can get to heaven together. In Galatians chapter 6, you know, Paul kind of talks about this, you know, brothers. Again, he's writing to the churches of Galatia, this, this area. There, there's some different churches in this area. He said, all right, so church, if anyone's caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Help each other out. Don't just sit there and say, whew, that's, uh, that's sin. <sighs> Glad I'm not them. I'm just going to sit back here and... Um, <coughs> They'll probably figure it out on their own. Help each other. Because you too one day may need the help. And if you are helping others, and then when it comes time for you to need the help, uh, well, you've got a whole family that's there to, to help each other out. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself, but let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. 
for each will have to bear his own load. See, we all need to help each other live right, act right, keep learning, keep doing. Because eventually, yes, we need to be able to help each other. We need to be able to encourage each other, to be able to edify, build up each other. But on the day of judgment, we're going to be standing in front of the judge by ourselves. It is our life compared to the scriptures. We can help each other get there, but eventually it is going to be just us. Let's help each other be ready. The church is where we learn to follow others or help others follow us. Again, we can, uh, we can read words, we can study together, but again, sometimes uh, we learn more visually. We learn more by example. And so sometimes we're able to find somebody. Because so listen, they're, they're finding temptation. They're not, you know, they're, they're heading down the right path. They are, are living life like I, I, I should be. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what, what they do. As long as what they're doing is following Christ. And that's exactly what Paul said to the church in Corinth. Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. That meant if I go off the rails and I start doing something that's wrong, don't follow me. The standard is still Christ, it's not Paul. And so we can be there to help each other out. As I'm following the footsteps of Jesus, follow with me. Because one day I may need to follow your footsteps as you are following Jesus. Church is a collection of disciples, apprentices who have committed themselves to the task of following Jesus. A commitment, a group of people committed to following Jesus. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We're here to help each other. We're here to help others outside of each other. We're here to be disciples of Jesus. Learners, apprentices, workers for the Lord. But here's the warning. When we commit to becoming a disciple of Jesus... We have to give up some things. There's some things that we, we may have over here that so we, we really kind of like this. But it's not in his instructions. And so we're going to have to we have to get rid of them. I, I didn't make a complete list. Uh, just, a, just a few things. But one of the things that we're going to have to get rid of is sin. Well, I mean, see, that sounds really easy, right? Oh, sin's bad. God doesn't like it. That's going to keep us out of heaven. Okay, I'm just going to get rid of it. What about this? See, it's, it's really easy for us to be able to point to others. And you know, if somebody needs to ask a question in general, should we get rid of sin? Yes. That was an easy question. What if there are some things I've always done? What if there are some things that I have recently done that I kind of like? What if there's just a way that I live my life? If it's going against God's will, it's sin. <coughs> Isaiah talked about it again, that what separates us from God? So God's not weak. He's, he doesn't become less powerful. Does it, our sin separates us from God. When judgment day rolls around, we don't want to be separated from God. So, yes, no matter what it is, we got to get rid of sin. 
Uh, we look at, uh, I think it's in the uh, bulletin this morning, uh, Romans chapter 6 is, is, is uh, mentioned in there. Again, this idea of uh, being slaves to sin. Uh, do we want sin to be our master? Do we want Satan to be our master? Do we want this temptation to take over and, and us uh, move completely away from God? Or do we want to choose life, freedom, salvation? Do we want to become servants to God? then we get rid of sin. We have to uh, get rid of self-centeredness. Again, it's, it's not all about me. Now, the world will tell you different. Uh, it's, uh, you, you deserve whatever it is that they want you to have. It, uh, you know, something that, that you need. If, if you want it, and uh, go get it, no matter what it is. And that has caused a lot of people to lose their souls because they decide that this life is what they want. It's Christ-centeredness is what we need and not self-centeredness. Which really, again, that I think that rolls right back around into self-centeredness. I want to go to heaven. So I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that I get there. Now, that means that other people are involved in that. But that's not a wrong attitude, according to the scriptures. We need to make sure that no matter what, that is our goal. Following after the Lord. He's in heaven, and that's where we want to be. The idea of self-centeredness, again, that the world offers us. Where we put us first. That's what God wants us to get rid of. We have to get rid of hate uh, so we can love. And again, that's uh, there's a lot out there in the world. And it may, uh, hate may be a strong one. Maybe it's just really, really strong dislike. Maybe hate's not strong enough. Maybe it's just, just loathing. That, that's worse, right? <clears throat> Jesus was being lay down on some wood and had these uh, spikes driven through his body. They were killing him. And it wasn't like, hey, we're just going to take you out and boom, it's done. It's, we're going to take hours to watch you die. We're going to make fun of you while you're hanging there. Blood's going to be pouring out there and you're just, your, your body is just going to just cave in. It is going to be excruciating, and we're going to laugh and make fun of you the entire time. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. See, John 3.16 was true before the world even began. It was true as he was dying on the cross. It's true today. Jesus and God loved the world even those who were murdering him, and even those who he was on the cross for, which is, well, everybody who ever has lived is living now and will live in the future. If he wasn't hating on the people that were murdering him, why, why us? Why, why, why would that give us permission then to hate the person that cuts us off in traffic or hate the person that got the job and we didn't or hate the person that got the person that we wanted hate the people that got the money that we wish we had and all I mean there's all kind of different reasons to not like somebody we need to get rid of hate so that we can love so we can share the gospel so we can be a disciple a true disciple <clears throat> we need to give up hell and I know, again, that's one of those things. You just, hey, would you like to give up hell so that you can get heaven? Yes? Is this a trick question? But there are a lot of people in the world who have a very, very firm grasp on hell. What is our soul worth? See, it's, it's worth the life of Jesus. It's worth, I mean, he came down here to die on the cross.
the opportunity to go to hell must be tremendous because there's uh, folks that just uh, well to give about anything to go saying a few words that they shouldn't be saying living a lifestyle that they shouldn't be living uh, you know, a few bucks here and there maybe it's a maybe it's a little item that they want and they just go ahead and take it it could be a big item I, you know, but it's, again hell must be worth it at least according to their actions they may say differently they may answer the question correctly but their actions are different where are we Again, I think all of us in here can answer the question correctly. Are you willing to give up hell so you can go to heaven? Do our actions match the answer that we would give? And again, we've got to give up our way. kind of goes back to self-centeredness. Doing things because, well, that's the way I want to do it. That's the way I've always done it. I feel really good about it. Yes, I know the scripture says this over here, but I really want to do it this way. We have to give that up if we are going to be a true disciple because are we going to really follow after the master teacher or not? And so we're going to ask a question this morning. It'll be in song. It'll, you know, some of the words will rhyme. It'll, it sounds really good. I love this song. But pay attention to the words because we're, we're singing to each other. Who's going to follow Jesus? I, I'm hoping all of us can say that that's me. In spite of the costs, in spite of what it takes, in spite of the effort that we have to put into it, in spite of the reaction we may get from our family or our friends or our coworkers or you know strangers, I'm still going to follow after Jesus. What does that mean? We've, we've touched on some of it today. Of course, it, it means more, but it takes study, learning, and then action on what we study and learn. It means recognizing Jesus as our master. That means that we are going to do what he says, learning who he is, that he is the son of God, that he came here to this earth to, to seek and save the lost, and, well, that was me. And now because I've found him and he found me, I'm willing to confess that he is the son of God. I'm willing to change my life to live the life that he wants me to live, to really follow after him. And I'm willing to get rid of the sin. That one thing that separates me from God, I'm, I'm willing to get rid of that. And he said that was in baptism. So it will wash away my sins. And then I'm willing to continue to follow after him if there's questions you may have if there's something that we can do to again to, to study with you more to answer some questions we'd love to be able to help if you need encouragement if you need to be able to, to come back and follow after Jesus we'd love to be able to help do that as well even now as we stand and sing Who will follow Jesus, standing for the right, holding up his banner in the thickest fight, listening for his orders, ready to obey. Who will follow Jesus, serving him today? Who will follow Jesus, who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in life's busy ways? Working for the Master, giving Him the praise. Earnest in His vineyard, honoring His laws. Faithful to his counsel, watchful for his cause. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? 
I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in his work of love, leading others to him, lifting prayers above? Courage, faithful servant, in his word we see, on our side forever will the Savior be. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Thank you again, Gary. A good, very good lesson. It's always a great blessing to be able to assemble with you here and to worship God in His way, as we've done uh, in spirit and in truth. Um, remember those announcements made earlier, and especially those that we want to remember in our prayers. Uh, folks need encouragement, need some help. So uh, may we always be alert to opportunities we can help one another. Um, it's always good to have visitors with us uh, as well this morning, too, and you're very welcome to, to be with us. Uh, after we uh, sing our, uh, one verse of our closing song, uh, we'll be uh, led in prayer by Bob Scott, and uh, we'll also offer thanks for the food that we're about to uh, enjoy together and hope that everyone can stay for that. Also, don't forget to sign up for um, Saturday night. Hope, hope everybody can be here. As a reminder of some of the things that G uh, Gary mentioned to us, what Jesus said, he said, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Uh, let, us, let that be our desire to uh, follow our Savior, uh, even as we go from this place. I can hear my Savior calling, I can hear my Savior calling, I can hear my Savior calling, take thy cross and follow, follow me, where he leads.
as we uh, work together, then we trust in your 